Okay, welcome to Word Without Walls. Welcome to the Summer Saturday service. The title of the message today is Living Faith. And uh, I posted this on my Facebook yesterday. I was really kind of having a lot of trouble landing on a sermon for today. I was studying out some things and I was writing some things and I was doing a lot of things in the Word, but I couldn't really figure out what I wanted to say. And then I realized that was the problem, because it's not about what I want to say, it's about what God wants to say. So I stopped trying so hard to figure out a sermon, and I asked Daddy what he wanted to say, and this is what he gave me, living faith. And uh, the question is, how do we live this Christian life? How do we make what's true, true for us? How do we walk in the finished work that is Jesus? And the simple answer is, we do it by faith. Four times in the Bible, the, the phrase, the just shall live by faith, occurs. And we're going to look at all four of them, and I want to move through those, through those quickly because I have more to say about it. But the first time is in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. And in the King James it reads, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And I think right off the bat, this is key, because two things about the Bible is, one, if something's repeated, and, and especially if it's repeated four times, that means it's important. And two, there's a thing in the Bible called the law of first mention, and that means when, when something is first mentioned, it kind of sets the tone for how it's used throughout the whole rest of the Bible. So what we see here in Habakkuk chapter 2 is we see kind of a uh, comparison or a contrast between two different kinds of people. We see him who has his soul lifted up, and it says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. And, and what we understand for the soul to be is our mind, our will, and our emotions. Basically what this is saying is, living in the world, living according to how you feel, living according to what you want, living according to your soul or your mind, will, and emotions is not upright. That's not living the Christian life. That's not receiving who Jesus is or what he did. And then it says, in, on the contrast, it says, but the just shall live by his faith. And that word just is number 6662 in Strong's Hebrew Concordance, and it means just lawful, or righteous man. So again, just like always, the only thing the Bible ever really talks about is Jesus. The just man, the righteous man, the lawful man is Jesus. So what he's saying here is there's really there's two choices. There's two men that have ever lived. There's Adam, who was a living soul, who did everything according to his own mind, will, and emotions. And then there's the just man, Jesus, who lives by his faith. And again, before the cross, we were all in Adam, we were all Adam. But after the cross, we are all in Christ, we are all Jesus. So again, this, this choice really doesn't apply to us, except in the, the term of, really, on this side of the cross, you can be who you want to be. God made it available to us, but he doesn't force it on us. So if we choose to lift up our soul, then that's one thing, but it's not upright. It's not living the Christian life. It's not... Uh, apprehending what we've been apprehended of. It's not receiving the gift. It's not living the abundant life that Jesus came to give, give us. Or, the just shall live by his faith. And it's important here in Habakkuk, it says, by his faith, because the rest of the verses we're going to see, it doesn't have that word his, but because again, we have to understand whose faith it is we're living by. We don't live by our faith. We live by the just man's faith. We live by the faith of of Jesus, and we're going to look at that again later on, but I want to set the stage and say the only thing our faith needs to do is connect us to Jesus. I believe in Jesus, and then his faith takes over, and then I live this Christian life by his faith, which means I live this Christian life by letting him live it in me. And that's really the answer to the question, how do I live this Christian life? I don't. Jesus lives his life in me. And that's how it all works. And that's what the faith is. Again, as we're going to see when we go through this, the faith that we need is just simply Jesus. That he is who he is, he did what he did, and it means for us what the Bible says it means for us. And what he did was he went to the cross, and he became us, and he died so that we could become him. And that's what it means. It means I'm not living at all, but Christ lives in me. 
And we're gonna, again, we're going to go through all of this stuff, but I want to get through these other verses of the just shall live by faith. So the next one is Romans chapter 1, verse 17. And in the King James, Romans 1, 17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So now all of a sudden in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, we've shifted away from being, uh, away from the soul being lifted up, and, and now we're talking about how we reveal the righteousness of God. Which again, it, you know, if you've heard me preach recently, this is so important to understand that, that we don't just have the righteousness of God, we are the righteousness of God. So what this is really saying is this is how our true self is revealed. This is how we live this life. This is how what's true becomes true for us and manifests in our lives. And it says it's revealed from faith to faith. From our faith in Jesus to Jesus' faith. That's the faith to faith. All my faith has to do is connect me to Jesus. And if it's done that, it's done everything. That's why the Bible says we have been given the measure of faith. And really, what the measure of faith is, is Jesus. Faith is believing, and Jesus came to give us something to believe in. He came to show us that there's a more excellent way. He came to show us that love can work and operate the way it's supposed to, apart from any rules, apart from any regulations, apart from any laws. Because, guys, it's not about a law you keep. It's about a life that keeps you. And this life that keeps us is the life of Jesus inside of us, working in us and coming out of us. And that's what it means when it says the righteousness of God, which, which again is, is us, but more accurately, Christ in us, is revealed from faith to faith. And, in, and then it says, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So again, this is making it even, even more clear that, that in the Old Covenant, you had to try to get your soul under control, so to speak, and, and be led by the Spirit, because... In that old economy, that's what man was. Man was a spirit and a soul, and those two parts warred against each other, and, and there was struggle, and there was strife, and, and there was a lot of double-mindedness, and, and the book of James says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, and that's what this Christian life feels like so much of the time, but like, like even what Paul said in another place, talking about being under the law, he said, the things I don't want to do are the things that I do. And the things that I want to do are the things that I can't seem to be able to do. He says, I want to do what's right, but I can't do it under this law. The standard is too high, and I cannot meet that perfection. And it's not until we get out of the mindset of our righteousness and into the mindset of the righteousness of God that we can understand that if it's the righteousness of God, that means it's not me doing it, it's Him doing it. It's His righteousness. And that's what I have become because He lives in me. And that's what my faith unlocks when I believe that. When I believe that Jesus lives in me, that allows Jesus to live in me. And again, I'm convinced that he's in there, period, no matter what. But, it, but, but it's like, we, we, it's like the, the, song, the book, The Song of Solomon, describes us in the Message Bible as a secret garden. Like, we have everything we need inside of us, but we don't even know what the secret is. We don't even know what we have. We don't even know what we're capable of. And again... That's what Jesus came to do. He came to shine the light, and he came to say, it's in you, and all you have to do is believe it. And then the secret garden, after you turn the light on, the secret's out. It's not a secret anymore. Then what's in you can't be held in anymore. Then the, the gate is open, so to speak, and you come out of the bondage of trying to live this life, of trying to finish the work, of trying to do it all yourself, and you come into the glorious day of rest, the Sabbath day that is Jesus, and you believe that he finished the work, and then he does everything he wants to do in you rather than you trying to please him in your own efforts. Trying to please God in your own efforts will never, ever, ever work. And that's the, that's the problem that Cain found himself in when he brought a uh, offering to the Lord from the, the fruit of the ground, from what he did, from his labor, and God didn't accept it. But his brother Abel, a shepherd, brought the first fruit of his flock the, the, the shepherd brought the lamb, which again all points to Jesus. Jesus is the true shepherd. Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The only thing God will accept is Jesus. So if I'm trying to live Jesus' life, I've totally and completely missed the point. But if I believe that Jesus is living in me, then I've got it all because he is it all. So again, it's from faith to faith. It's from our faith in Jesus connecting us to Jesus' faith. 
and that's so important as we're going to see, but I want to keep moving. So let's look at the next one, which is Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. Galatians 3.11 in the King James says, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. So again, what we see here is the principle in the New Covenant that it's not a law you keep. It's the faith in the life that's in you. It's all about understanding and knowing and believing that if Jesus is living his life in me, then I'm justified then I'm righteous, then I'm holy, then I'm perfect. If the perfect one lives in me, that makes me perfect by default. Because I'm not defined by the outside, I'm defined by the inside. I'm not defined by my actions, I'm defined by my daddy. I'm defined by my DNA, the divine nature of the Almighty. I'm defined by who lives in me. And the more I understand that, the more I believe that, the more that manifests itself. So again, we see that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. God did not give the law of Moses so that somebody could keep it and he could say, there's my God. He gave the law of Moses to show that nobody can keep it. He gave the law of Moses to show that his standard is too high for man to get to. God does not want us to ascend up to him. God, in fact, descended down to us and then brought us up to him. He did all of the work. All throughout the scriptures, God is always looking for a man. He's always looking for a righteous man or, or a just man. And that man is Jesus. And when Jesus came and he walked on the earth, he kept the law because we couldn't do it. And again, that's what he was showing us. He was giving us something to believe in. He said, you have this law, but it's contrary to you. It's against you. It doesn't make you perfect. It demands perfection. And when you're not perfect, all it does is point out your flaws. And that's why it's called the ministry of condemnation, because the only thing the law can do is condemn you. It can't make you feel good about yourself because you're constantly failing. You're constantly judging yourself and you're saying, man, I really screwed up this time. Look what the law says I should do and look what I'm doing. Just like we said what Paul said, I know what I should be doing, but I can't do it. I want to do good, but I can't. And I don't want to do bad, but that's all I seem to do. And that's how it is under the law. That's the bondage of sin and death. But again... That's what the cross, in large part, the, uh, 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 a huge part of why Jesus was crucified is so that he could become a curse for us because the Bible says, Cursed is any man who hangs on a tree. And by becoming a curse for us and then dying and then rising again, he reversed the curse. He got it out of the way. He nailed the law to the tree and took it out of the way and said, Listen, it's not about the law anymore. It's just about me. I kept the law for you and as you because you couldn't do it. Now I'm going to live this life for you and as you because you can't do it. Nobody can live Jesus' life except Jesus. Nobody. You cannot be justified in the sight of God by the law. You cannot be justified in the sight of God by your own effort. The harder you try, the more you will fail. But Jesus came as the perfect, spotless, sinless lamb, laid down his life, and then picked it back up. And when he did that, a transformation happened. Something changed. We got out of Adam and into Christ. The old passed away and a new creature came forth. And this new creature is Jesus, God in the flesh, love in a body. And that's what we are. That's what we've been filled with when we were given the Holy Spirit. Now we are that same love. Now our faith connected to Jesus supersedes the law. Now the death that was attached to the law is swallowed up in life because, again, Jesus died and then rose again. He proved that death has no power over him. And when he did that, he said, now it's not about rules anymore, now it's about life. Now it's not about death anymore, now it's about abundant life. Now it's not about darkness anymore, but it's about light. So again, it's not about what you do, it's about who you believe in. And that's the most important thing I think I'm going to say today. You're not defined by your actions, you're defined by your beliefs. Because your actions flow from your beliefs. What you believe, bottom line, is what you do. If you believe that you're a sinner, you're going to sin. If you believe that you need to please God through your efforts, that's what you're going to try to do. But instead, if you believe that Jesus lives in you, that takes all the pressure out of the way and it says, all right, if Jesus lives in me, I don't have to do anything because He's doing. he already did it and he's doing it in me. So that's, again, that's the key. That's what it means when it says the just shall live by faith. So the last one is Hebrews 
and in the King James it reads like this. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. This is almost a direct quote of our verse in Habakkuk, talking about the soul, bringing it right back around to the law first mentioned, saying, when we're talking about living by faith, we're talking about the soul taking a back seat, so to speak. Or again, I believe on this side of the cross, the spirit and the soul both being swallowed up in the Holy Spirit. But I preached on that before, I don't really want to get back into that. But it says, the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So how do you draw back from living by faith? If you go back into believing that you can do it on your own. If you Listen, the Bible says the way that you fall from grace is by putting yourself back up under the law. If you take if you take God's rest and you say, no, I don't want to rest, I need to work, that's how you draw back. And Jesus said, if any man puts his hand to the plow and, and looks back, he's not fit for the kingdom. Jesus wasn't saying, if you do that, you can't have the kingdom. He's saying, if you do that, you're not experiencing the kingdom. If you turn away from the kingdom to the world, then even though you're still in the kingdom, you're not living where you are. You're living as a stranger in the promised land when you think you can do it yourself, when you think you need to do it yourself, when you lose your faith, I, I guess you could say, or when you fall from grace. But again, making a mistake is not falling from grace. Because another place in the Bible, still talking about the just man, it says the just man falls seven times and gets up every time. And, and again, who are we talking about? Jesus. So Jesus fell on the cross and died, and then he got back up. Because, it's, again, it's not about your actions. It's about your belief in the one who did the work. It's about your belief in Jesus. That's how we live. That's just not how we get to heaven. That's how we live. That's how, on a daily basis, we can get through everything we have to get through. And uh, it's interesting, too, that every time in these three verses in, in, in the New Testament where it says... The just shall live by faith. It's number 1342 in Strong's Creek Concordance. And in the Old Covenant, it meant just, lawful, or righteous. Because again, the Old Testament is all about the law, the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Law. In the New Testament, that word just means innocent, holy, or righteous. And again, what we see here is it's still talking about Jesus. Jesus was lawful. He fulfilled the law. And because of that, he was innocent and holy and righteous. It means righteous in both times. So, so it's a different kind of righteousness. In, in the Old Covenant, it was about man's righteousness by keeping the law, which was impossible. But in the New Covenant, it's about the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In the New Covenant, it's not about what you do. It's about who you are. And that's the, one of the biggest differences between the two covenants. The, the, the Old Covenant, or the law, said... You have to do this in order to be accepted. In the New Covenant, it says you're accepted because Jesus is accepted, and now you can do all these things that you really wanted to do. Now it's not, I can't, I, now, now, now in the New Covenant, it's no longer, I want to do good, but I can't. Now it's, I want to do good, and that's what I'm doing because that's who I am. Now I want to love, and I'm so full of it that I couldn't do anything else if I wanted to because we've been filled with something. We've been given something. The, uh, the gift of eternal life has been given to us, and now when we believe that it's been given to us, now we can receive it. Now with the Holy Spirit, our love receptor, we can receive God's love instead of trying so hard to earn it. So now let's look at Galatians chapter 2, and believe it or not, this is actually my main text for today. I want to read Galatians chapter 2, starting with verse 6. 15. And in the King James, it reads, We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, and again, when, when, when Paul spoke of being a Jew, what he spoke of was being a true Jew, not, 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 a, not a member of the Jewish national origin, but a believer. That's what he meant by the term Jew. Jew means believer and Gentile means unbeliever. So what he's saying is if you're a believer by nature and not sinners of an unbeliever. So again, what is he talking about? The only thing that really that he ever talked about was what it means when you believe, which is what faith is, believing because God has shown himself to be faithful. So he says, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, 
even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. These little words are important, and we're going to get to them, but let me finish the verse here first. It says, justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. By the works of the law, by your own effort, you cannot get to where you want to go. The only way you can get to where you want to go is believing that Jesus already got you there. And then you stop trying to get there because you realize, I've been here the whole time. So, let's look at these little words. Uh, of and in. It says, man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only man ever who could have been justified by the works of the law because he kept the law, he fulfilled the law, he did not break the law. But that's not even what it says here. It says Jesus, even Jesus who kept the law, was justified by his faith. He was justified by the, we, it, it says a man is justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. And again, what was Jesus' faith? Jesus' number one thing that he believed that at that time nobody else could believe was simply, God's my father and he loves me. And that was so radical at that time because at that time everyone looked at God as if he was angry because we were aliens in our minds because of our wicked deeds. We were enemies in our minds because of our wicked works. We thought, look at what a screw up I am, there's no way God can love me. If I clean my act up, maybe. If I keep the law better, maybe. And Jesus came and said, that's not, that's not anything. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about an angry taskmaster God. We're talking about a heavenly Father who is love and can only love. And that flipped the whole world over, man. That 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 got that that made people want to stone Jesus. And Jesus said, "What why are you trying to stone me?" And he said, "All I'm doing is going around doing good works. I'm going around healing people. I'm keeping the law. Why do you want, why are you trying to kill me?" And they said, "For good works, we don't want to stone you. We want to stone you for blasphemy because when you say God is your father, you're putting yourself on the same level." And Jesus basically said, "Yep." That's exactly what I'm doing because that's exactly what the truth is. We are on the same level with God because he lives in us. But again, at that time before the cross, that shift hadn't happened yet, so they couldn't receive it yet. But that's what Jesus came to show, and that's what he came to put in place. And that's what the cross was. The cross was when the kingdom came. The cross was when God moved into man. The cross was when our, our faith in Jesus became the faith of of Jesus for us. Jesus always had perfect faith and he will always have perfect faith. But man doesn't. We have doubts. We have fears. We have times where, where, where we still put ourselves right back under the law, where we still fall from grace and we say, you know what, now that I've done this, how could God possibly love me? That's man's faith. Man's faith is action based. Man's faith is according to what I do, let it be so. But Jesus' faith is, no, 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 God loves you. Doesn't matter what you did, doesn't matter what you said, doesn't matter what you thought. God loves you. That's the faith of Jesus Christ. And that's what allowed him to live that perfect sinless life. He didn't mess up, not because he thought, if I mess up, God will be mad at me. He didn't mess up because he knew, there's no pressure on me. Even if I mess up, God's not going to be mad at me. And when you take the pressure off, when you take the yoke off, and when you take the bondage off, then it becomes about living and not about trying so hard to please somebody. So then it says, uh, but even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Believing in Jesus appropriates for us the faith of Jesus. That's all our faith ever has to do, is say, Jesus, I believe in you. And Jesus says, all right, if you believe in me, now my faith becomes your faith. Now my unshakable rock nature becomes your unshakable rock nature. Now that you've entered into something through your faith, remember a couple of weeks ago on a Tuesday, we talked about how God made the covenant with Abraham? Not with Abraham at all, he made it with himself. And then he included Abraham in it through Abraham's faith. That's how we get all of this stuff that was promised to us. That's how we receive this gift, is simply by believing that God gave it to us. We live by believing that we have abundant life and believing that Jesus is living it in us. And if we can believe that much, if I can believe that Jesus is living in me, then his faith, which allowed him to live the life we all want to live, then his faith takes over and he lives that life in us. So that's how we're justified. That's how it all works. And it goes on in verse 17 and says, 
But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. And again, he's, he's, he's kind of pointing out the problem here. He's saying, if we're trying to believe in God, but we're messing up, does that mean that Jesus isn't really living in us? Or, or does that mean that Jesus is sinning in us? If, if, if I believe Jesus is living my life, but I'm still messing up, there's a discrepancy here. What's going on? And he says, God forbid. He said, that's not what's happening. He said, for if I build again the things which I destroyed and make myself a transgressor. He says, listen, if you mess up, whether or not you're believing or not, that doesn't mean Jesus messed up. All that means is that you messed up. He's saying, if you build up this faith, but then you lose some of it, that's not on God, that's on you. But then he says, for through the law, am dead to, for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto Christ. He's saying, here's the key, guys. What you have to do, a big part of your faith, is believing that you're dead to the law. Believing that failing does not make you a failure. Believing that I can mess up and Christ can still be living in me. I can mess up and I can still be the righteousness of God. Because watch this, it says in another place, where there's no law, there's no transgression. And let me say it like this, if you're on the road and there's no speed limit, you can go as fast as you want to go, and you're not going to get in trouble. This is kind of what I was talking about last Saturday. But, here's the thing, you can still go fast enough that it's unsafe. And that's the difference. That's what Paul was saying when he said, all things are lawful unto me, but not all things are expedient. I can do whatever I want to do, but that does not mean that I'm going to do things that are not smart. There's a life inside of me that I choose to let come out of me rather than going my own way. I'm dead to the law. I'm dead to bondage. I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to all that stuff. That stuff has no more power over me. That stuff has, that, 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 that desire in me is no longer in me because it died. Uh, that's what it means to be dead to the law. So then, in verse 20... Again, probably one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. So, so what he's saying here is, I died when Jesus died on the cross. His death was not just for me, his death was as me. I am crucified with Christ. He died and I died right there 2,000 years ago on the cross. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Because if you died on the cross with Jesus, you rose when Jesus rose. If one thing happened to you, the other thing happened to you. I feel like we get so stuck on, yeah, I died with Christ, but then we never make the shift to say, but, I, but, but he rose again, so so did I. I died, yet I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. I'm not the one, I may be alive, but I'm not the one living. I can't live his life, so I need to stop trying. What I need to do is believe that he's living in me, and that's how I live this life. That's what living faith means, or, or faith to live by. So he goes on and says, And the life which I now live in the flesh, the life that we live in this human body, the life that we live in what appears to be this worldly dimension, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So again, my faith is simply believing that Jesus loves me and gave himself for me. If I have that much faith, I have all the faith I'll ever need. If I believe that Jesus did what he said he did, and if I believe that it means what he said it means, and if I believe that he lives in me right now, that's all the faith I'll ever need. Because that faith attaches me to Jesus, and then his faith, his perfect, unshakable faith, comes into play. And if Jesus lived his whole life on the faith of knowing that God loves him, then I can live my whole life on the faith of believing that Jesus loves me. Jesus says, the Father loves me and I love you. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Jesus said all of these things to show us what it means to be loved by the Father. Even using the term Father, uh, again, that was revolutionary. That was something that nobody said and nobody believed. Even Adam, who, who, who the book of Luke identifies as the Son of God, Adam did not believe that God was a loving Heavenly Father. Adam believed that God was a taskmaster who put rules in front of him and, and blessed you if you did good and cursed you if you did bad. That was Adam's mindset. That's what the soul tells us. That's the worldly mindset that we have drilled into us. If you do good, you'll be rewarded. And if you do bad, you'll be punished. That's the way of the world. But that's not the way of God. The way of God is right here. If I... I live this life in the flesh by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the way of God. Sacrificial love. Jesus said, no greater love has a man than to lay down his life for his friends. 
And Jesus said, You are my friends if you obey my commandment. And Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, love one another as I have loved you. So he made this great, this great big circle where he said the biggest love you can have is to lay down your life for your friends. And then he went and did that, empowering us to be able to do that. Empowering us to love with that same sacrificial love. Uh, empowering us to not only love each other, but to give ourselves for each other. To give ourselves to each other. To connect with each other through love. Instead of drawing up all these walls and, and building all these, you know, divisions and saying, yeah, I love you, but I don't know if I can whatever. No, there's no yeah, but in love. Love is I love you, period. And that's the way that God is. That's what God showed us on the cross. That's God's unchanging nature is I love you, I love you, I love you. I'm never, ever going to stop loving you. And that's what our faith needs to get us to. If our faith can believe in Jesus, then his faith, which allowed him to do all of the things that we want to do, takes over. And then he starts living his life in us. I believe Jesus loves me, and that's what lets me let him live in me. Because if I trust him, then why wouldn't I do what he says? If I trust God that he loves me, then why wouldn't I believe that everything he wants for me, if he leads me by the Spirit, I can follow, because I know he has my best interests at heart. I trust him. I know he loves me. It's like the same thing with Logan. Logan knows that I love him. So when I tell him to do something he doesn't understand, Sometimes he, he'll question it or whatever, but, but he does it because he knows that I'm for him and not against him. He knows that I'm not trying to do bad to him, but I'm trying to help him and guide him and protect him and lift him up. And that's what the Spirit does. Those who are led by the Spirit are the, son of, are the sons of God. So again, it's not about blindly following anybody. It's about saying, listen, I know my daddy's good, so you know what? If he tells me to do something, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to trust him. I'm just going to believe that he truly loves me and everything is working together for my good. And again, that's what faith is. It's God showing himself faithful and then us believing, not, not something that we haven't seen, but something that we have seen. Believing God loves us because he shows us that he loves us. God does the first part and then we just respond to it. God makes the way of grace and then we come in with the walk of faith. And that's what it actually says... Uh, in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by what we believe, not by what we see. In the world, we see things that look bad, and we see situations we may, may want to stay out of, and we see all these different things, and we want to close ourselves off and protect ourselves. But that's not how we walk. We walk by faith. We walk in a finished work rather than trying to walk out something that we think God did. So again, it all comes right down to, if you believe in Jesus, then that opens up the door. Then that lets the secret out of the garden. Then everything that he says he is and everything that he says we have can start to manifest in our lives. It all comes from our belief in him. Our faith in him connects us to the faith of Jesus. So in verse 21, back in Galatians 2, it says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ died in vain. It says, listen, if I believe Jesus died, if I believe I'm under grace, if I'm not concerned about the law, if I'm not trying to do this myself, then I'm not frustrating the grace of God. And even if I mess up, that's what grace is for. Grace allows you to fail without being a failure. Grace allows you to mess up and to, and, and to keep moving forward. Grace allows you to learn who you are, even if it takes baby steps. You can't all of a sudden tell somebody you're righteous and expect them to know what that means and expect them to be able to walk in that. It's a maturation process. It's a growing process. And just because you mess up, that does not frustrate the grace of God. Again, the only way to fall from grace is to put yourself back in that old economy that Christ died to bring you out of. So let's run through this real quick in the message. And then I have, it looks like two more verses. And then I think I'm done. Galatians 2, starting with verse 15 in the Message Bible, reads, We Jews know that we have no advantage of birth over non-Jewish sinners. We know very well that we are not set right with God by rule-keeping, but only through personal faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, how do we know? We tried it, and we had the best system of rules the world has ever seen. Convinced that no human being can please God, by self-improvement, 
We believed in Jesus as the Messiah so that we might be set right before God by trusting in the Messiah, not by trying to be good. There's no such thing as a good Christian and a bad Christian. There's no such thing as, well, I'm doing a better job living his life than you are. There's just Jesus, and he lives in us. And the more we believe that, the more he comes out of us. So again, it's not about trying self-improvement. Self, I don't want to improve self because self died on the cross. The old man, you can fluff him and buff him, you can dress him up nice, but he's still the old man. And he's still going to work out of that soul realm, out of that mind, will, and emotions realm. Whereas, again, the just man, Jesus, does not live by his soul, does not live by his mind, will, and emotions. The just man lives by faith. The just man lives by believing that he's just, by believing that he's righteous, by believing that God's not mad at him, and that, and again, that gives opportunity to mess up and to stay on the right path, to stay where you are, to stay in daddy's house, whether you mess up or not. If, if, if a servant messes up in daddy's house, he might run away because he might think daddy will get mad at a servant. But a son knows, I can mess up and I can run to daddy. One of the most important things that I think I've been trying to teach my son, Logan, is that no matter what, you can come to Daddy. Even if I have to discipline him, and even when he cries, what he does when he's crying is he runs to me. Even if I'm the one that's disciplined him, and that's what I want, because I don't want separation between us. If I have to correct him, I want to say, listen, we're still on the same team. We're still on the same side. I still love you. You messed up there. You did something you shouldn't have done, but that does not disqualify you from our relationship. That does not disqualify you from my love for you. All it does is it, it, it means I have to step in and show you something. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. It guides us into all truth. All truth being, God loves us no matter what. So again, it's not about rule keeping, even with the best system of rules ever. Even with a system of rules that God approved of. And he said, listen, if you could do this, I, I, I guess I'd be pretty happy with you. Knowing that we could not do it. And that's why, again, that's why Jesus took it out of the way. So it's not about religion, it's about relationship. It's not about the law, it's about grace. It's not about trying to be good, it's about trusting in Jesus. Going on with verse 17, it says, Have some of you noticed that we are not yet perfect? No great surprise, right? And are you ready to make the accusation that since people like me, who go through Christ in order to get things right with God, aren't perfectly virtuous, Christ must therefore be an accessory to sin. The accusation is frivolous. If I was trying to be good, I would be rebuilding the same old barn that I tore down. I would be acting as a charlatan. So again, what he's saying here is we are perfect, but we don't act like it. So so what's the discrepancy here? Does that mean that, that Jesus isn't perfect? Does that mean that, that when I mess up, but Jesus is living in me, that Jesus is messed up? And then he says, no, that's not what it means. It means what I've done when I mess up is it's not about the act of messing up, it's about the belief that caused the act of messing up. If I stop looking at Jesus and I start looking at other stuff, then I might get into some stuff that I shouldn't get into. And then in verse 19 it goes on and says, What actually took place is this. He's saying Jesus didn't mess up. What actually took place is this. I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God, and it didn't work. So I quit being a law man so that I could be God's man. And that's it right there. Do you want to be a son of God or do you want to be a servant or a slave of religion? If, 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 if you would rather try to work your way up the ladder, it's not going to work. Or you can just be God's man. You can be a man of God and you can, or, and, and you can be a God man. You can let what's in you come out of you rather than trying to gain something when you already have it all. He says, Christ's life showed me how and enabled me to do it. See, we don't just follow Christ. He set the example, but then he says, don't try to follow the example. I just showed you what I'm going to do in you. So that's kind of how we can test the spirit. We can say, well, you know what? If I just did something that Jesus didn't do or wouldn't have done, then that was me and not Jesus. Jesus didn't mess up. I messed up. But he still lives in me. And if I can just believe that he still lives in me, I can stop that mess up, I can recalibrate, and I can get back to being a God-man. And then it says, uh, I identified myself completely with him. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It is no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion. 
I am no longer driven to impress God. I think this is really, really, really important that we stop trying to impress God through what we do. When I get up to preach, I don't try to impress God. I try to listen to Him and I try to say what He's saying. I try to be on a team with Him rather than saying, I'm over here trying to impress you and you're over here and I hope that it works. Instead of that, it's about connection and unity and love. Whereas again, I'm not preaching. I'm just letting Jesus do it through me. I'm not trying to impress Him. I'm just letting Him live His life in me. The most impressive thing that God will ever see is Jesus in one of his other creations. And that's why he put Jesus in all of his other creations. God wanted the best for us, so he put the best in us. Over and over, God says, be perfect as I am perfect. But that's an impossible thing to do by yourself. But, it, but with God, all things are possible. If the perfect one is in you and you believe that, then that righteousness, that perfection, that holiness becomes not what you have, not what you do, but who you are. And if I am perfect, but I mess up, all that means is I don't know what it means to be perfect yet, but I'm learning and growing. So he goes on and he says, I'm no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. That's, that's how you impress God, by Christ living in you. Jesus is the one who God was impressed with. Jesus is the man that God was always looking for. Jesus is the one who God can point to and say, that's my boy. And if he's living in me, when Jesus, when, when God points to Jesus and says, that's my boy, he's pointing to me and saying, that's my boy. Or pointing to you and saying, that's my boy. That's him right there. That's my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Don't look at the outside, look at the inside. So then it goes and says, the life you see me living is not mine, but it is lived by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I am not going to go back on that. Again, that's what faith is. Believing in Jesus and standing firm on that rock. And saying, I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it feels like. I don't care what I, well, I don't care what my old man who is dead tries to whisper in my ear and say that I want. I don't care about all that stuff. The only thing I care about is Jesus. And when we get to that place, man, that's a level of faith that, that will literally, literally overflow out of you with the love of God. So he says, I am not going to go back on that. Is it not clear to you that to go back on that old rule-keeping, peer-pleasing religion would be an abandonment of everything personal and free in my relationship with God? God gave us a relationship with himself freely. He said, you don't have to earn a relationship with me. You don't have to climb the ladder. You don't have to ascend up to where I am. I'm going to come down and meet you where you're at, and we're going to fellowship, and we're going to have a relationship, and, and I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit so you can receive my love, and then out of that love, everything else is going to flow. It's all about not what you do, but what you believe. If you believe Daddy loves you, that empowers you, period. The affirmation of a father will always empower the son. And again, I want to use Logan again because sometimes I will tell him, you know, you need to clean up your toys or else you're going to get in trouble. And when I tell him that, he usually falls apart and screams and, cries and, and, and screams and cries and gets mad because he doesn't want to get in trouble, and that's what he's focusing on. But other times, I'm starting to learn, if I'll bring him up to me and I'll tell him what a good boy he is, and I'll tell him how smart he is and, and, and how wonderful he is, and then I'll say, okay, now it's time to clean up our toys. Now that he feels good about himself, now that he knows daddy loves him, now that he knows that he's rock solid in his relationship, now he can go do good works. Now he can go clean up his toys, no problem. Now he's happy to go do what he needs to do, rather than doing it, you know, grudgingly or, or, or doing it to avoid getting in trouble. Now it's not a law that he's trying to keep, but now it's a life that is keeping him where he needs to be. And that's what this whole deal is about. It's not about do good or else. It's about, man, you are so loved that it just all, all the good works just flow right out of you. It's not even about trying to do good. It's not about trying to be a good Christian. It's not about anything except believing that Jesus is living his glorious, everlasting, abundant resurrection life in us. And that's what he's talking about. If you go back to the rule keeping, then you're abandoning that relationship. You're trading the relationship that is freely given for a religion that has to be earned. He says, I refuse to do that, to repudiate God's grace. If a living relationship with God could come by rule keeping, then Christ died unnecessarily. And I want to tell you that Christ did not die unnecessarily. Christ died to get us out of all that bondage. Christ died to 
close out that old covenant and to open up a new covenant. Christ died to get rid of religion and give us relationship. Christ died to literally have us give us something to believe in. He gave us our faith. He gave us the ability to believe that God loves us but by taking His faith and, and putting it in us. And that's all we do, again, is we just connect faith in the Son of God to the faith of the Son of God. So let's look at two more verses. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. The, uh, I think it's pretty familiar. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But I want to read it in the Amplified Bible. It says, Now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality, faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. And again, this is so important because sometimes it feels like God doesn't love us. Sometimes we think there's no way God could be anything except mad at me right now. But what faith is, is faith is the conviction of reality. And the reality is, God loves you, period. So when it doesn't feel like it, that's not, that, that, you know what, that may be a fact. It may be a fact that you did something that is worth punishment, but truth is higher than fact. And the truth is, is Daddy's not going to punish you. He may correct you, he may guide you, but that's not punishment. That's helpful. That's for your good. That's Daddy saying, I love you no matter what. You, you screwed up, but you're not a screw up. You're still my son, and I am willing to do anything, anything for you. God loves you so much that he would rather die than be without you. And that's why he died, so that he would never have to be without you. Way back in the Garden of Eden, Adam messed up and hid from the presence of God. And, and I don't think God liked that very much. So what God did is he came and he became Adam and died and then rose back up as Jesus. And he said, now I'm, uh, I'm going to live in you and you can't hide from my presence anymore. If you were to hide from God's presence, you'd have to hide from yourself. And you can't do that. Wherever you go, there you are. And wherever you go, there he is because he's in you. So here's what we're saying is that faith is conviction of reality. What is believing what is real, no matter what the circumstances look like, no matter what somebody says or what somebody does, no matter what you think or what you do, faith is knowing, knowing what is true. And again, how do we know it? Because Jesus showed it to us. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He says, if you want more than a religion, if you want a relationship, here it is. He gave us something to believe in, and, and then he put that belief inside of us so that we wouldn't ha even have to go anywhere for it. It's right here in us. But I want to focus on where it says, this leads into my last verse. It says, faith is the assurance of the things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see. So that then begs the question, what do we hope for? What's hope? What are we talking about? And the answer is in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, where the King James reads, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So what we're hoping for, what faith, uh, our assur faith is the assurance of the things that we hope for. It's the confirmation in the title deed of the hope of glory. So, so, again, what is the hope of glory? Christ in you. That's what we hope for. That's what we want. That's what we long for. And that's what faith delivers on. That's what faith says, this is what it is. This isn't something you have to hope for. This isn't hope deferred, which the Bible says makes a heart sick. This is hope realized on the cross. Everything you've ever wanted is everything you already have. You just didn't know what it really was that you wanted. You wanted God's love and you tried to find it everywhere that you could find it and you came up with the conclusion that vanity, vanity, all is vanity. You came up to the conclusion that there's nothing new under the sun. You came up to the conclusion that this life is just meant to be suffered for for a little while and then hopefully I'll die and go to heaven. But what you were really wanting, again, God's love, that hope is realized by Christ in you. And that's what faith is, is the assurance of the things we hope for. It's the confirmation of the things we hope for. It's saying, man, I really wish Christ lived in me. Oh, wait, he does. 
And my faith is what makes that true. My faith is what makes that real. My faith is what takes the cross from an idea to a reality. It takes me out of the world and into the kingdom that I'm already in. And it says, okay, now I can be who I really am. Now I can be where I really am. Now I can enjoy this life instead of struggling through this life. My hope, the hope of glory, Christ in me, has been confirmed and realized. It is assured. I have the title deed. If you have the title deed to a house, that house is yours. You can go in there. You can move in and live there. And again, Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions or many dwelling places. He said, I'm going to give you the title deed. I'm going to open the door and I'm going to say, come on into Daddy's house. And the best thing about it is the way that he did that, the way that he lets us move into Daddy's house, is by moving into us, by making us that house. He says, you want to live in me, but more than anything, I want to live in you. And if you can believe that I live in you, that's how you live in me. If you believe that God loves you, then that's how you dwell in that love, live in that love. That's how that love becomes real for you and fills you up to the point that you can't hold it in anymore. So I hope what we see is that faith is not just about going to heaven someday. Faith is about living in heaven today. Faith is not just what we want. Faith is having what we want when we understand what it is that we really want. When we understand that it's not about religion, but about relationship. When we understand that this faith, it's not for someday, it's for today. Now faith is. I've heard it said, if it's not now, it's not faith. If you're hoping, if, if, if you have faith that Christ is going to live in me someday, that's not faith. That's hope. But if you have faith that your hope has been confirmed and realized... That's faith. If you come to the place where you say, yeah, the hope of glory, Christ in me, that sounds awesome. That's not faith. But if you say, they're, they're, the, the hope of glory, Christ in me, is here now, then guess what? Then I'm, in glory, then I'm in glory right now. I don't need to ride around on a glory cloud because I am a glory cloud. Everything I need is already in me. And when I believe it, then I can start to apprehend what I've been apprehended of, then I can start to use and enjoy the gift that I've been given, rather than trying so hard to get what I already have, rather than trying so hard to get to where I already am. I don't need anything because I have it all, because I believe that Christ lives in me. That's what faith is. That's how we live by faith. That's what living faith is. The ability to stop trying to live this life and to just believe that Jesus is living it in me. Amen.